with this project, uh, originally it stemmed out of um, a grad school paper that just never, so far just has never finished its life. Um, it's a blessing and a curse at the same time. Um, Vermont Beer was, uh, that I co-authored with Kurt Stoddard um, is, was kind of the first work really diving into the widespread um, history of brewing. Um, I was kind of surprised about how brewing was such an important aspect of um, a lot of economies around, uh, state economies around the country and I was curious about Vermont and it, um, I was researching the history of hops that led to the history of brewing and what ended up happening, Vermont beer kind of was the over, overview of the entire state. Um, the second book that I, I authored, uh, Vermont Prohibition, was kind of all the things that were cut out of the first book by the publisher. Um, somehow publishers don't believe that Prohibition and, and beer should be in the same book. And then uh, the third part of this was that there was a lot of I kind of lamented that I wish the first book really took a lot of the oral histories from the brewers and the, the why, you know, not, not the how. And uh, basically this project came along and uh, long story short, um, there was only one person that I was willing to do another book with, um, which is Jeff. And the irony was that uh, I had told my wife after the publisher had approached me and I said, look, I'm really, you know, my wife's asked me to take some time off from writing and so forth, and uh, and I looked at her. I said, "Look, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it solo." And there's only one person that I'd dive into that, and she agreed. And she also had said Jeff. And then the next day, Jeff calls me, literally, because the publisher, you know, wanted to find me a co-author, and randomly went to him. So uh, the history of uh, craft beer in beer now we use it as craft beer in Burlington is. Um, is, is unique compared to anywhere in the country. And sure, every place is gonna say, oh, it's unique here. And it's unique in Burlington because of the fact that we had a, a big window where nothing happened. So this entire renaissance is homegrown, which can't be said of anywhere else in, in the country. And, and I'll, I'll elaborate on that. Um, so starting off in Burlington, uh, the first brewery that um, opens up is 1800 by Daniel Staniford. And his brewery um, stands ironically where Pearl Street Beverage um, stands in uh, Burlington. True, uh, true. And breweries at that time, um, you have to really look at, at the context that um, alcohol now is a social lubricant. Um, that's kind of the, you know, we, we go here in Montpelier, it's, you know, run to three penny tap room. Um, it, you know, it was, uh, Thrush Tavern was joking, jokingly known as the second house um, in reference to the, the House of Representatives next door. And in this time though, breweries are a value, uh, both an a agricultural value added product, but also a, a source of calories. And you have to understand that at this time, you are heavy into food preservation and you need to preserve calories, especially to get through times like this outside. And so Daniel Staniford opens up um, the brewery and breweries at that time were not just solely a brewery as we know it today. It's basically an entire multifaceted operation. So Staniford has not only a brewery, but also a distillery and also a potash, as well as a, a milling, milling and malting operation. So now, in this day, brewers can make a phone call, get grain sent, you know, malted to their exact specifications from anywhere in the world. Back in 1800 New England and 1800 Burlington, Staniford literally was sourcing local grain and malting it himself, milling it himself, and literally from the ground up um, brewing, uh, which is really a, a, a talent and art in and of itself. And with the distillery, you basically have the same setup as a brewery where you have to make your, your mash that is gonna ferment and then, um, or you make your, your wort, ferment the wort, and at that point, it's either beer or it can continue on into um, distillation to make um, whiskey or gin or some other um, distillate. And the potash was actually, uh, the operation of the potash was valuable because of all the wood burning that was required for the, the kiln for malting as well as the brewing. They were able to uh, recapture um, basically the waste and sell it um, predominantly to Canada for uh, potash. And Stanford had um, the, the, early, the earliest brewery. There were references 
And um, this is a, a, what I kind of reference as the curse of this project is new research comes out, new, new documents are found, and all of a sudden, you know, what, what was once just references, you finally find that actual document. It happened to me with uh, the original Vermont Brewing book where uh, Jabez Rogers opens up a, a brewery in Middlebury. It burns, he rebuilds it, and it burns again. And that was kind of the last note. And then I found a document about two years ago where a local newspaper mocked Rogers because there was a, a very mild uh, chimney fire that uh, was put out very quickly. And they said, you know, poor Jabez, you know, if it happened a third time to his brewery, you know, you know, it's the worst of luck. And I'm sitting there going like, oh, so he did get it back and running a third time. And so you, con you constantly find this information. And um, so there were two other, uh, there was a reference to a, a brewery by um, a gentleman, Loomis, in Burlington, which I never was able to find any more information of or records. But Stanford had a very successful uh, brewery. Um, the, the, it, I have definitive um, sources that it was running from 1800 to 1808. Um, it could very well have run for additional years after. Um, the easiest reference and the best reference were the local newspaper um, clippings where really every season um, people were referencing just, hey, I need X amount of grain um, or X amount of bushels of barley for this brewing season and that's how you could kind of trace who was doing what. Um, so Staniford ends up shuttering his operation and um, the real important character uh, or person is uh, Samuel Hickok who opens a uh, brewery in uh, 1827 and gets what is known as the Burlington Brewery up and running. And he had the operation on a, um, South Champlain Street in Burlington. And the 1853 map of oh, this, uh, have that. Um, I'm gonna have to, on the next slide is the uh, map from the 18, the earlier map. Um, uh, Hickok has the brewery for a fair amount of time and then ends up um, selling it and this brewery changes hands. Um, it never shutters um, through 1830s and 1840s. And it does suffer a fire, but is within a season rebuilt. And this time it was built fireproof, um, which in historic preservation terms uh, means it was brick, the building. And so he rebuilds uh, and the brewery is sold to uh, George Peterson. And Peterson uh, has the brewery in full operation and here, this is when it's the Peterson Brewery and then later sold to, uh, or given to his son, Benjamin, um, hence the reference to a B. Peterson in 1862. And um, the issue at hand, there. So um, this is the map with the original um, Hickok Brewery on there. And the brewery is highly seasonal. And this is something that we've kind of gotten away from. And you know, you'll see a lot of food magazines promote the seasonality of food. So the brewing season back then started as soon as the hops were harvested, which was usually the last two weeks of August at that time period. And would the, you know, instantly start up and you'd see the advertisement that the brewery is, you know, is up and running and the first ca you know, casks of ale will be available in you know, the following week. And the brewery literally ran till it was out of grain. So there was no, if it was a great season with abundance, it was running into April, and the shortest season that I saw, it actually uh, stopped brewing in January. Um, and at this point, you are, imagine having an a, a modern brewery that literally you are dependent on whatever was harvested right now, where, you know, and you don't have the global supply chain that's available now. Uh, it's a pretty dicey business, so that, that's why it was a lot of, you know, brewers were not only a brewer, they had other, op other businesses. Um, in Hickok's case, uh, he was the owner of a dry goods store and was selling casks of ale between the brewery as well as, as his dry goods operation. And, uh, you know, it was uh, unique also because at that time, um, it was very likely that the, uh, the brewer was actually not a brewer, but a brewster. And I don't know if anyone's ever heard the term of a brewster. Um, the person that was behind the, the actual brewing was referenced as E. Hickok. And I went through all of the, the Burlington records and his wife 
name was Eliza Hickok. And it was um, at that time period still considered, um, originally in the 1600s, uh, brewing was uh, considered a, a female's task, a woman's duty. And it was known, and she was known as a brewster, and the male was known as a brewer. And although there was no references found, the documents that were around the advertisements, everything was signed E. Hickok. And there was no extended family with, with the E in the name. So it was most likely that uh, um, Samuel Hickok's wife, Eliza, was the brewer um, overseeing the, the actual brewing operation. So um, you know, one of the quotes that I, I had put in the book that uh, Jeff and I kind of had a surprise, got a lot of traction, um, was that we've moved away from the tradition of brewing from a season now, and now brewing for a season. And that was, you know, in the brewing, um, the part that I always love, I, I'm openly will rant on pumpkin beers. I'm, I'm not a fan. And it, because it's such a misconstrued reference that, that uh, modern brewers do. And um, so in that time, yes, you will find references to pumpkin being added to the beers. The reason being is that it was a very poor sugar content in the grain or a rough grain year. So they were trying to boost the, uh, the sugars in the wort for fermentation. So you would find references to sugar beets being added, uh, roasted pumpkins being added to the beer. And in now in this day and age, all of a sudden the pumpkin beers are coming out in July because they want to have it out on the marketplace for the fall. That is pumpkin that was harvested the previous year and processed and sitting in you know, honestly, some valuable real estate in a brewery just sitting through the year waiting for the next year to actually brew the beer, where traditionally pumpkin beers were coming out in usually October, November. And even when I first got into craft beer in the very early 2000s, uh, pumpkin beers were coming on the market in October. Uh, and now the first one, it's, uh, it's a big running thing with uh, my wife is who spots the first pumpkin beer on the shelf. Uh, this year was uh, July 21st. Um, thankfully, the first Oktoberfest happened to come out five days later, so we're getting better on that. So George Peterson has the uh, Burlington Brewery, and um, the big issue that happens is Vermont goes into Prohibition. And Vermont goes into Prohibition, not 1918. Um, Vermont goes into Prohibition in uh, 1853. And um, the, I, I do love the irony of this because I was just over at the State House and uh, I was staring at the, the statue of Erastus Fairbanks. He was the governor that signed Prohibition in. And Temperance um, had been gaining steam um, through the 19, er, 18 teens and 1820s in Vermont and all of New England. Um, pair with it a religious revival um, known as the Great Awakening. And uh, you, you have this perfect setup that um, alcohol consumption was moving away from being a food source to being a major social issue. Um, and that you find references in the newspapers about farmers um, struggling to find uh, labor because there was references to um, intoxic you know, too much intoxication on the farm. Uh, business owners were struggling. And uh, so it really kind of picked up steam and a lot of the local temperance groups were able to get their footing and then kind of build upon that and petition Montpelier and the um, State House to ultimately consider uh, state prohibition. Um, they experimented for the four years before 1853 with uh, each county um, voting whether to go wet or dry. And 1853, the entire state goes into prohibition. Um, the irony of it, it bans brewing, although Burlington Brewery does get grandfathered in, but they cannot sell any uh, of their product in Vermont. And uh, it's also important to note, um, so that's from a later owner of the Burlington Brewery. And if you note that the point of sale on it is, um, I believe, Elizabethtown, New York. Um, the sales for the Burlington Brewery in Burlington were all through Plattsburgh, New York. And um, so at this time, there's no distilleries in 1853. Uh, we had a, a, a peak of 220 distilleries um, in 1820 in the state. Um, irony now, we now have Caledonia Spirits in Montpelier and the craft distilling scene is gaining momentum in the state. And we have one operational brewery. Uh, ciders are left totally off. And uh, so in, in Burlington, you find references to 
um, ciders uh, that are still for sale. And basically, you know, it's before Louis Pasteur, it's before uh, microbial theory. So it's basically like, huh, well, if you leave that fresh pressed cider juice, you know, if, if it happens to become alcohol, you, you just, you can't sell it. You can't sell it, you can't, you know, money can't change hands. But it's really left still as, you know, in the gray area of prohibition. So you do see cider sales. So this is a, pretty much a non-discreet uh, yellow brick building, yellow painted brick building on Champlain Street in Burlington. Um, I took that uh, two years ago. Um, with the work of uh, State Historian Devin Coleman, um, this was the, um, by the maps, the original site of the Burlington Brewery. But what's happened here is that this building used to be at the corner and was moved, um, basically, uh, once the brewery went out of operation in the 1870s, um, it was, the building just became too deteriorated and was ultimately uh, taken down and some of the materials repurposed and they moved a warehouse building that was on the corner onto its original, onto the brewery's original site. Um, so we do know where, where exactly it was. And one of the, the other aspects of um, the, the beer um, scene in, you know, it, we've moved away during Prohibition and you had a lot of people that had businesses as independent bottlers. And independent bottlers were um, something that's quite rare, I guess, to say now. Um, you find that, um, I would say, what, in the scotch industry, the last, uh, you know, the last independent bottlers. And what these independent bottlers were would be an operation um, that you had all the glass produced for you, usually with your name of the business on it. And you would source casks of beer, of spirit, of other beverages and liquids uh, from around the country, even around the world, and you would bottle it in your, your shop, um, carbonate it if it was uh, you know, an early beverage using um, uh, carbonic acid, and, uh, you know, and you would ultimately be the local point of sale for national brands. And in the two labels I threw up here uh, shows one was um, a bottling company in, in Burlington, and I believe the other was Church Street in Burlington. And um, they could even get the labels uh, produced for their need. So I do love that it's not over 4% alcohol because at that time, um, small beer was, was permitted um, later on in, in the whole history of prohibition. I'm gonna really skip over a lot of it. Um, but small beer becomes legal. Small beer is 3.2% alcohol by volume. So the reason that it says that it's 4% by weight, sorry. And um, so not over 4% uh, by weight would mean 3.2% uh, by alcohol. 3.2% or by, by alcohol by weight equals 4% alcohol by volume. Volume, thank you. Mix that one up. And um, so this way, they, because they were able to get that uh, added to the PAPS Blue Ribbon label, they were permitted to sell it. Um, going, looking at 1850, uh, 1853 Prohibition, um, the, the real epicenter of the whole Prohibition um, fight was Burlington. Um, and the reason being is that it had the most critical and devastating effects on tourism and development in Burlington. And uh, it, in uh, Vermont Prohibition, I found accounts um, that were um, spoken to a gentleman who spoke to Percival Clement, uh, who ultimately became governor of Vermont. Um, he was uh, in the gubernatorial election in 1902 as a candidate uh, for the anti-prohibition party, and, um, or it was known as the high, high license local option party, um, that there was a business owner that literally wanted to build a resort on uh, Lake Champlain and wanted to do it in Burlington because of the, of the rail system that was in place. But because of prohibition, he opted to build it over in Plattsburgh. And the whole, the whole resort that he built is actually the community college campus now in Plattsburgh. Um, and it was quite a large undertaking. And the, the, the siphoning and the vacuuming of money out of the economy in Vermont 
and especially out of Burlington, was, was massive. I, I can't stress it enough, and I often say that part of what we see in Vermont, um, how everybody loves this, you know, all the iconic images of Vermont and agriculture and so forth, we actually um, shot ourselves in the foot in terms of development in Burlington and in that region um, with Prohibition and for the fact that it was 80 years, essentially. And one of the other aspects of the tourism um, was uh, Governor Woodbury, um, who was uh, in the um, 1890s. Um, his, uh, there was this common aspect in Vermont politics, uh, where it was the 100-year rule of the Republican Party, and it was kind of this political machine that you became Speaker of the House, then moved to Lieutenant Governor, then you, you were Governor usually for one two-year term, and then you went back into the business sector. Um, arguably in a lot better standing um, to conduct business. And in terms of uh, Governor Woodbury, he um, had Hotel Vermont, uh, one of the earlier iterations of the Hotel Vermont. And here you have, in 1890s, a governor that was totally for prohibition and got totally nailed multiple times for selling uh, beer and wine out of his hotel and argued at the fact that he needed to do this to stay competitive in the tourism trade. So. You, you even have one of the, you know, the person in charge of you know, the state and this law basically not even abiding by it. So it leads us to um, one of the most horrific creations in Vermont history called Uno beer. And um, it, it's really, I, I, I have to kind of go off on a tangent. So I, I put the slide together uh, you know, yesterday morning for my research. Um, I'm, in my day job, I'm an art and furniture conservator, and I've been doing work at the State House the last two weeks. And um, while I was checking in with the assistant state curator, uh, he had a bottle that was uh, brought to him on his desk. And it was a clear bottle, and it was William Miller, Montpelier. And, uh, you know, I was like, I literally just wrote about that, and I explained the history to him. And then last night, I got home and I checked my work email for my writing, and literally somebody in Mass uh, Amherst, Massachusetts sent me a photo last night. Hey, we just bought this bottle. It's William Miller Montpelier. Could you tell us something about it? So it was this, like, the gentleman passed away in, 19, in 1915, and all of a sudden, three times yesterday, you know, popped up. Uh, so William Miller was uh, a bottler here in Montpelier. I know it's not part of Burlington, but it is important because he did create something called Uno beer. And he just, he read the letter of the law, prohibition, the definition um, for Vermont for beer at that time was a, a um, fermented malt beverage. And, you know, so he said, oh, okay, well, cool. I'm gonna make a gluten-free beer. There's no, there's no malted grains in the, in, the, in the beer, so therefore it's not beer. And he kept it to 3.2% uh, alcohol. Um, the really disgusting side of it is that he used uh, powdered um, albumum, uh, powdered egg whites to thicken the beer. Uh, by all accounts, it was just bad. And you find these amazing references of like, oh, we've hit the new low, Uno beers for sale down the street now. And so he created, and honestly, he created quite a fortune behind it because it was a niche, a niche market, um, and there were people that wanted to consume alcohol. And he was able to, for about ten years, um, you know, have a very successful operation, and was uh, was well known through most of Vermont for this Uno beer. Um, in the 1902, um, it, it's important just to briefly touch on it that. Um, so you have uh, General uh, McCullough running f uh, for the Republican Party um, for the gubernatorial p um, seat. And then um, Percival Clement, who was in the Republican Party, had uh, tried to become um, the candidate and was turned, you know, basically said no because McCullough was working his way up through that chain um, at the State House. And uh, Clement was a business owner uh, for Rutland and also a uh, mayor of Rutland. Um, so he ends up running on the, the uh, local option ticket, basically with his entire platform saying, hey, we need to, we need to get money going. We, you know, Vermont's struggling, the economy's struggling. Um, now, I'm going to just throw this out here. When was the last time you heard about uh, legalizing an illegal substance, earmarking a portion of the tax revenue, we're going to tax it way up, 30, in this case, alcohol was going to be taxed into the 40% uh, tax bracket, 
we're going to earmark 10% for education, 10% for local municipalities, 10% for state uh, general fund. Yeah, it's awesome. We're repeating history. Um, so it goes through 1902. The whole election literally is dominated by the discussion of prohibition and the need to reverse prohibition. And I couldn't believe it. I found, you know, it, it's, it's kind of the, you find one reference, even if it's a primary source, you, I was still skeptical, and then I found multiple other references. Um, so there was concern because Percival Clement, as an independent um, with this high, high license local option ticket, um, was gaining so much momentum and traction in the press and in, in his uh, speeches that um, the Republican Party opened beer halls in Burlington for 1902 um, with the idea of come have a beer and it's on the Republican Party and we're gonna you know come support the local candidate and uh, this article that I threw there was uh, from the uh, Randolph Herald and basically saying how appalling it was that you have somebody running on you know the Republican Party and you know the the carrier of prohibition and here are these beer halls pouring beer um, to you know, basically buying votes. So, um, one of them, by the way, popped up, uh, <coughs> uh, popped up in Hotel Vermont with uh, go former Governor Woodbury. So we have in Burlington, Vermont, the last brewery shutters again in the eighteen uh, late eighteen seventies. It is a hundred years before a brewery starts again in Burlington, Vermont. And that window is important because when I've done historical research on um, other projects in terms of, if you look at Boston, if you look at New York, uh, Milwaukee, uh, or Chicago, great examples where you have a very large um, European um, ethnic groups that usually have a very long, rich tradition in brewing, you know, federal prohibition is 1918 to 1932. And you're, you're really, yeah, the, it's, it's a long stretch, but in terms of, it's not even a generation, you know, by any means. Whereas 80 years in Vermont, you have the equivalent of three generations. And you basically, the, the idea um, that a historian had put out, um, and I, I forget, his last name is Woods, and I forget his uh, first name, is that every generation is a half-life of knowledge. So the one generation, it will only pass on half of its knowledge to the next generation with the next generation basically adding their own knowledge building usually improving you know in science in you know all the different aspects whereas in brewing when you go three generations you basically wipe out your your heritage of brewing um, there was one reference uh, book that i found uh, it was the a company of amateur brewers um, and it was a homebrew group in um, southern vermont uh, they all used uh, um, fake names, except uh, I did catch out who was behind it all because um, it was so good that they put a copyright on it and you can't use a fake name on a copyright. Uh, it was Rest Orton uh, from the Vermont Country Store, uh, the founder of it, that had, was part of this homebrew group and he actually had a reference to a Burlington Ale and um, it was kind of the, what was being brewed up there before you know, pro federal prohibition took hold. Um, so there are these little aspects, but there's no, there's no heritage. So we start with, um, you know, Vermont Pub and Brewery, uh, nine, uh, it was how many years of uh, um, legal wrangling to get it open? Was it like two? So Vermont Pub and Brewery opens up in uh, November, November 11th, uh, 1988. And it is a brew pub, which is something pretty radically new that uh, people just struggle to, to understand that idea of the fact that you had a full restaurant plus your own brewery in the same building. And Greg Noonan, who is just, you know, well-deserved, the, the godfather of Vermont's brewing scene, um, who was fairly home-taught as well, but um, really pursued great detail on, on the knowledge of brewing, um, started brewing with no, uh, with no, he, he was brewing what he wanted to drink. So there was no, like, we have to keep up with the English tradition or the Irish or the German or the Dutch. And it was a, a brewery where things were just being made, you know, to mimic styles that he saw in his travels. And uh, 
at this point, I think it's a good time to hand it over to Jeff. Before I continue with the, uh, the Vermont pub story, I, uh, the 3.2 beer thing was on my, on my mind because it's in the news right now. Uh, Minnesota is the last state that still has 3.2 beer on the books. Um, and uh, most of the major breweries who, who brew a variation of, of their beer at 3.2% by weight, um, Anheuser-Busch, Miller Coors, uh, they have all said they're gonna stop brewing those beers because there's only one state left. And so now there's a lot of pressure on their state legislature to change that law. Um, it's, uh, there's a lot of law changes happening right now. <laughs> um, so yeah, so Greg Noonan uh, and his wife Nancy um, had this radical idea of uh, um, doing a brew pub. And the idea was not only to have a restaurant and a brewery, um, the sticking point was that you couldn't brew beer and sell it in the same location. Um, so the state didn't understand what he was trying to do. And in fact, one of the, um, and, and neither did the banks too, when he was trying to get a loan, one of the banks actually asked him, like, what the hell is a brew pub? Like, so it was an idea that was happening out west, uh, but he was really one of the first to bring it to the northeast. Um, they worked with uh, Bill Maris, who was in the, in the um, state senate then, then, to get those laws changed. And uh, there's some pretty famous pictures of them uh, cutting the ribbon and, you know, uh, high five. No, not high fiving. But um, it's not only important. Vermont Pub and Brewery is not only important because it was the first brewery in Burlington at, uh, after a hundred year gap, but it's also important because a beer style was created at Vermont Pub and Brewery. Um, have you heard of the Black IPA? It's um, a style that was uh, invented and we, I think, have finally set it to the record again that uh, it, was, it was first brewed in, in Vermont. Um, December 3rd, 1994, uh, Glenn Walter, who is uh, Greg's assistant brewer, was going through a really nasty divorce and wanted to brew a beer that was um, dark and bitter like his heart. <laughs> and so he developed the, the idea of the black IPA. Um, and it's, it's been proven, the, uh, the, they gave us the brew log, which is dated, uh, and a copy of that appears in the book too. Um, so the West Coast people who are trying to claim that they invented it, they can stop making that claim. This, once VPB was open, uh, we go six years uh, before the next brewery gets opened, uh, and that's Magic Hat. Um, Alan Newman and uh, uh, Bob Johnson, had a, kind of a crazy idea to uh, start a uh, performance space and um, also a brewery, and they couldn't come up with a name, and, and one of them just came up with Magic Hat, and they shopped that name around, and into all accounts, everybody hated it, uh, so that if you've ever met Alan, you know that if somebody else hates his idea, that that means he's gonna go for it. Um, so they come up with Magic Hat. They dropped the arts uh, performance space um, and just kind of focused on marketing and doing uh, some pretty, pretty out of the box um, brewing ideas. It is no longer in Burlington, uh, but it was originally uh, in Burlington on Flin Ave. So that's obviously it's included in the, in the history. And uh, they also, Adam mentioned the Uno beer being terrible. Um, I think the other worst beer that was brewed in Vermont came out of Magic Hat and it was called Ale of the Dead and it was brewed with garlic. Um, it was in the market for about three days before it was recalled <laughs> and the brewer, uh, I can't repeat actually what the brewer said about the beer, um, but he did declare it his worst uh, beer ever and they kept cases on hand at the brewery and people would dare each other to do something and if you lost the bet you had to, you had to drink one of these garlic awful beers. Uh, there's a picture up here on the, on the uh, bottom left, it's a, another important thing that Magic Hat did, they built an anaerobic digester. Um, so they're one of the only breweries uh, in the country, as far as I know, that processes their own um, wastewater and cleans it up before they send it off into, uh, into the municipal system. But it's a pretty neat thing. It generates methane, and they can use that methane to power or to heat the brewery. So kind of a neat uh, development. Why is Derek Jeter on the screen? Well, when I was interviewing uh, Glenn Walter about helping in his brewery, uh, I asked him when it was open, and he, he looked me square in the face. He said, Derek Jeter's rookie year. I was like, I don't know when that was. <laughs> so now I know that Derek Jeter's rookie year was 1995, and I will never forget that. Um, and hopefully you won't either. Uh, Glenn Walter was, the, was, I mentioned, as the assistant brewer at Vermont Pub and Brewery. And he wanted to open his own brewery, and this caused um, 
some consternation between him and, and Greg uh, for a long time because he basically just went uh, two blocks over onto College Street and, uh, and opened the Three Needs uh, pub and brewery. And uh, there was some words back and forth. You know, there's a, uh, nowadays the, the Vermont beer scene is pretty happy and everybody's you know, pretty congenial, at least in public. Um, this was not a, a nice breakup, uh, but Greg eventually got over it and, and, uh, and wished Glenn well. Um, Glenn is kind of a unique brewer in, this, in the history of Vermont Brewing in that he is not a perfectionist and is actively uh, works against that. Most brewers, when they brew, they're, they're practicing. They're brewing uh, and trying to perfect recipes and, and really get it, hone it in. When Glenn brews, he doesn't do that. He just kind of freewheels it. And this batch is a little different than that. And he said that he really likes that conversation when people would come into, the, into his pub and say, you know, I think you missed the mark on this one, or this is the best keg you've ever done, which is kind of an unusual idea um, in, the, in the history of brewing, in modern brewing anyway, um, whereas where most people are perfectionists. The, I've also included here the original Duff Hour tap handle. Glenn had a really radical idea too to put a one keg of beer on tap for the day, and, uh, and they would tap it when um, The Simpsons would come on, uh, which was at four o'clock, and so Duff beer is the beer from The Simpsons. And uh, they would sell that keg of beer for a dollar a pint, and when the keg was gone, that was it for the day. Um, and so what it did is it got people to come into the bar early. Um, I think it's pretty good. So that, that tap handle is not in use now, but they, uh, they were kind enough to, to show it to us. Then we go to 2002, where we get uh, Bill Cherry uh, decides to open Switchback Brewery on Flynn Ave. So now we've got a brewery back on Flynn Ave again. Um, he, the switchback is important in, the, in this brewing history because they focused uh, almost on the opposite of what Glenn did at Three Needs, is that he brewed one beer and brewed it over and over and over and over again. It was just switchback ale. And it's the only beer that they brewed for, do you know, a decade? Uh, yeah, 2010. 2010 was when they started brewing other beers. So they really honed it in. And they also had a different business model in that they were draft only. There was no bottles, no cans. You couldn't, you couldn't buy it and take it home. Uh, you had to go to the bar and drink it. And so it became a, an iconic thing when people would, uh, would come back to Burlington if they'd been away. Oh, I've got to go get a switchback somewhere. Um, and it still has that, that following today where people, uh, I used to be a bar manager, and people would just come in. They wouldn't even look at the taps. They'd just say, I'll have a switchback. So it's kind of a unique thing. It's, it's like in the movies when they're like, I'll have a beer. <laughs> you know, and it's kind of Burlington's. Uh, call beer, if you will. Um, they did start brewing uh, uh, other styles, and they did finally put their beer in cans, which they were kind of dragging their feet over the years, but um, Bill kind of came around on that. So two years later, you get uh, Paul Saylor and, a, and his uh, partner decide to uh, go into the beer business, but they want to do it with a restaurant, and they want to do a brew pub. So we're going to get Burlington's second brew pub, they teamed up with the American Flatbread Group uh, to open American Flatbread Burlington Hearth. That, partner, uh, that relationship has since dissolved, but it is still called American Flatbread, so they're not related to the, uh, the pizzas that you can buy in the grocery store. Uh, and they wanted to put their own brewery in, but they wanted to do it in a different way. Paul Saylor fell in love with beer. Um, uh, he was actually one of the head brewers uh, at Catamount Brewing, if you remember Catamount. Uh, which, uh, as an aside, Harpoon Brewery is resurrecting that brand, so you're going to start seeing Catamount beer in the market again. He wanted to bring a tap room to Burlington. So Burlington had, a brewer had breweries, but he didn't see what he called a tap room. And the idea was that you would collect beers from all over the world, the best of the best, and, and put them on display and have conversations with, with guests about what, what the heck is a Dortmunder? You know, so he would go out and he made relationships with importers, but he wanted to put his own beers next to those beers to show that Vermont brewers can brew just as well as, as Trappist monks from, from Belgium can brew. And so originally it opened as um, a tap room with house beers, not a brewery with guest beers. And eventually they, uh, they got, their beers got so popular that they had to change that business model and they ended up opening the farmhouse tap and grill and shifting that tap room uh, to that program and expanding their brewing. And it got so popular that they had to build another brewery. Uh, so they built one on Pine Street uh, as their production brewery for zero gravity. 
Zero gravity is, um, if, you're, if you're familiar with brewing, there's a term called gravity. Um, this zero gravity has nothing to do with that. It's actually about the hummingbird. Uh, you can see their logo there, so like kind of floating in zero gravity. A little confusing sometimes. Then you get another uh, a brewery up on Pine Street, Queen City Brewing. Um, this is uh, Paul Hale is the, the brewer, and he was a, a home brewer for many, many years. Uh, his, his wife famously said that, um, you know, he, he said he called it a hobby, and she said, no, it's an obsession. Uh, so you have the opposite of Glenn here again, where he was dialing in obsessively batch after batch in his basement. He showed us his original brew logs, which um, a good friend of mine, Paul, uh, Paul Sarn, took some great photos of, and just really detailed notes. And he came out, he was a chemist by his day job, so he came at it from a very technical, analytic um, stance. Paul Hale's also part of uh, uh, Burlington's brewing history in that he coined a term for Pine Street, the whole Pine Street corridor. He called it Pint Street. And that, that really stuck. And now you've got um, Citizen Cider opened up there. You've got uh, Daedalus Wine Bar. There's this whole kind of um, beverage scene uh, that's happening on Pint Street. Um, and then uh, some more home brewers, uh, Dan Pawlowazic and his wife, Karen Ukolowitz, uh, opened Simple Roots. And they took a different approach to it that um, Karen, uh, Kara, excuse me, is from the north end of Burlington, and uh, if you know Burlington's geography, you know you can't get there from here, uh, so it's really a neighborhood community, and they wanted to open up a brew pub to serve their community. Uh, so it's really, it's off the beaten path in terms of, uh, it's not on Pine Street, it's not downtown, but it, uh, it, it actually got some national recognition for being an out-of-the-way brewery. Um, I can't remember the publication, but uh, it was a uh, Somebody found it and, and wrote about it as a little hidden gem. So another set of home brewers turned pro. And then we get this gang of uh, this Motley crew here. Um, I didn't mention with Magic Hat. Magic Hat kind of gets a, a bad rap these days as a, you know, because they've been sold off a few times. They're really a big part of Vermont's brewing scene in that a lot of brewers who have opened their own breweries started at Magic Hat and kind of learn the trade. It was like, it was like the training grounds. So you have um, Todd Hare, who's the gentleman on the far right there. Uh, he was a brewer there. Danny Casey, uh, or she came from Switchback. But a lot of these people came up through, through Magic Hat and then worked to Switchback, and then from Switchback decided to open their own brewery. So um, the group on the left here opened Foam Brewers on the waterfront in the old Taste of Burlington uh, location. I don't know if you're familiar with that spot. It was an old um, lumber processing plant uh, way back. And um, they decided they wanted to do something different again. This is kind of the theme, right? Everybody's like, well, I see what's already there. They wanted to do a brew pub where, where they didn't sell their beer anywhere else. You have to go to them. Um, since then, they've slipped a few kegs out for different, for different reasons. But they wanted to create an experience um, where everything from the lighting to the shape of the bar is, is kind of um, is very flowy. And what they wanted to do was create a situation where you weren't sitting in a straight line looking down at each other, that you were actually always facing someone, even if you didn't know them. So it's really about the space. They have live music. And um, so kind of pushing the boundaries of what, what a brewery can be. Uh, and then connected, at the same time as Todd Hare is, is working with these other four to open foam brewers, his friend Bill Maris, who some of you might recognize in the picture on the right, uh, approaches him about doing a, a blendery project. So buying uh, wort from another brewery and then putting it in oak barrels with wild yeasts and doing the fermentation in oak and then blending it from there. It's a, it's a very Belgian uh, kind of way of doing things. And, and Todd was like, well, I'm doing this other thing. And he decided that he could do both. And so uh, some of the wort from, for the House of Fermentology uh, comes out of foam. and um, it's kind of a symbiotic brewery relationship, but they are separate, um, separate entities. Uh, and we, so that was kind of where the history of Burlington Brewing ended when we, uh, when we finished the book. But of course, with all things history, uh, the second you publish, it's immediately out of date. Um, so we have a new brewery in Burlington. <laughs> this is uh, Freak 
uh, Freak Folk beer, and it is actually uh, the brewmaster at um, Queen City, Lillian McNamara, uh, with her partner, opened up a um, kind of like another blendery where they're doing wild ales and things too. So we wish them well, but I'm a little upset that you know she put her work out of date. <laughs> Uh, I, there's a lot of other history that we didn't get to cover, um, but if we covered it all, then you would have no reason to buy the book. Uh, so there's a lot of really fun things. There's a few um, hauntings that we uncovered. Uh, there's a lot of history of the actual bars that are in these breweries. Um, Wyatt Earp sat at one of, the, one of the bars, as did Jimi Hendrix, not in its location in Burlington, but in its former life out in Seattle. Uh, so we encourage you to, to pick up a copy, uh, which we have here today. <laughs> Um, and we do take credit cards. <laughs> but special thanks go out to Steve Palawazic who wrote the forward. Um, he's, he's the person behind Vermont Pub and Brewery now. Ian for uh, his research assistance and then Paul Sarn for photos. Did you have anything you want to add? Nope. Nope. All right. So, so thank you all so much and we're really happy to answer questions. What was the name of the new brewery? I Freak Folk. Freak Folk? Freak Folk. How many breweries are there now in Burlington? With the uh, with three folks, it's eleven now. So I'm, I'm curious with these older breweries in the 19th century. Um, how would they uh, seal up the beer to to actually get a uh, the carbonation? I mean, could you cast it well enough to? Oh sure, it was. The way that it was set up was uh, it's a way of the English cask style ale, which everybody now kind of, you know, it says like, oh, room, you know, quote, unquote, room temperature flat beer. Um, you were able in the oak casks or wooden casks to actually, um, you would do a natural uh, natural carbonation, um, which is taking usually some of the fresh water of the next batch to add it in to carbonate it. And you would have a very fine carbonation, but it would be um, what was known as real ale or cask ale, um, but yes, it was it was carbonated and you know usually on what's known as on the lees, meaning that the you know the yeast was still present in the bottom of the, the cask or bottle, so not the uh, crystal clear filtered, highly carbonated stuff we drink today. Yeah. yeah. So when did when did the bottles first, or when were they produced in you know a sufficient quantity that, that breweries would actually start bottling? Um, so, oh, that's a whole rabbit hole. <laughs> um, so you have um, you have things being bottled um, and by those independent bottlers. Uh, 1880s in Vermont, um, the first can was uh, in the 19, uh, I believe, the late 1930s. That was um, what's the famous New York uh, historical brewery? You okay? No, that was Knickerbocker Ale. Was there? Um, I'm totally blanking on that. It was a New York City brewery, but they designed the actual can, um, the can style that they could they could go. It was actually a cone top can. Um, but uh, to be honest, it, you know, it started then in in terms of the you know the glass and the you know, uh, cork and glass. Um, but it, you know, to be honest, we're still we, we've gone back to cans, you know, where they're out of vogue for so long, and mainly because brewers now are meticulous in no exposure to light, uh, the amount of oxygen present. Um, I know that uh, Greg Kipping at The Alchemist notoriously and meticulously tested um, every sample of beer in the can to the point that he got, like, I think almost no, no, it's, it's so low that it's, it's a minuscule amount of oxygen in the beer, um, which is one of the signs uh, that can spoil the, the beer. If you have an interest in uh, the history of canned beer, uh, go to Queen City Brewery. He has a whole museum quality, like you know, the whole wall of cans. It's pretty, it's pretty wild. Well, I, I for one, have never been a fan of cans. <laughs> On the graphic, uh, you showed a cast that was brewed by a company in Burlington. Were they like contract brewers? Did they get yeah. cast from? <laughs> No, so they were an independent bottler. So they were buying casks of packs from Milwaukee that was coming in on the rails. And they were simply then you know, partitioning it up into the bottles and car uh, adding carbonic acid to carbonate. And um, so it was it, it was still actually brewed by you know Pabst Blue Ribbon. And um, that was what the bottlers did, that they would just source from different 
breweries, wineries, um, spirits, you know, whatever the, the liquid that was to be bottled. So were a lot of the hops that were grown in some of these, you know, early brewing operations, were they um, sort of distinctive regionally as well? Uh, so Vermont, so we have, I you're going to talk about this <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, in, in 19th century Vermont, um, we have a huge hop industry. Uh, so it actually uh, took over the, the, the basically the, the fallout from the merino wool industry and became the new cash crop from about 1840 to about uh, the Civil War. And at that time, there's actually a reference that says there were only three hops. Uh, varieties in, in Vermont. One was Canadian red vine, which is still around and it's really low in terms of the alpha acid, which is the embittering part for hops. So it really was not used too much. Uh, there was no, something known as the grape cluster, which uh, we know now is, what is simply known as the cluster hop, which is uh, came over from England. Um, we can actually trace it to uh, the supply shipment from the Pilgrims, um, that, uh, the second ship that came over to to resupply them actually came over with 400 pounds of hop rhizome, which we knew was clustered. Um, and then the third one was actually a wild variant from Vermont known as the Pompey hop. And I believe it was called the Pompey hop. Um, it's just my speculation that it was found by the Papanusik and uh, Connecticut rivers. Um, what we do know is that that hop was stronger and more potent than the cluster and sought after. And there were two brothers from New York that sourced 50 pounds of um, what I believe to be the Pompey hop that in 1851 traveled over to California and started the first um, hop vineyard in California. So the entire Pacific Northwest industry actually came out of Vermont roots back in 1851. Um, the family name on that was Wilson. Um, but there was, aside from the, the, the terroir, if you will, the local growing conditions, um, it was likely the same um, cluster hop and pompey hop that was being used around the state. I, I turned that over to Adam because he literally wrote a paper on this. Um, what was the name of the paper? Um, it, was, it was called a, a Bitter Past and it was actually uh, um, awarded the research fellowship at, at the Vermont Historical Society in 2010. So it was the grad school paper that has never had the team. <laughs> so, I have a follow-up hop question. I, I've been seeing, I think it's on our social media, and I think it was Switchback was talking about um, they're doing some experimentation on the kind of full-on industrial, not industrial, but commercial use of Vermont hops. Do you know anything about that program? I mean, I know they're used by local. Yeah, so um, Heather, if, if you want to learn a lot about the, the Vermont hop, um, industry and what's available. Uh, Heather Darby at UVM, or Dr. Heather Darby at UVM Extension is um, really doing fascinating work. Um, commercially, from everything that I have taken away, and uh, I go every year to the Craft Brewers Conference, and uh, it changes where it is uh, every year, and uh, Jeff has joined me on some of those. And uh, you, know, you talk to the hot producers. Um, simply put, we cannot compete in Vermont with the alpha accents, which is the bittering compound. Um, that's being produced in the Yakima and the uh, Willamette Valleys um, on the Pacific side. But what we are seeing is that we're having much higher levels of uh, beta and cumulum, which are other flavoring and um, kind of the, the terpenes and um, esters, if you will, in the hop. And uh, so we are starting to see brewers playing with it and exploring it because now you may not, instead of trying to use local hops to bitter your beer, you can actually use something else to get that bitterness level up, but then all of that flavor and nuance you can build with local hops, and also as well in the dry hopping. Yeah, and when we talk about local hops too, it's important to know that uh, the strains of hops are pretty much the same. So if you're growing uh, Cascade, um, you know, you grow it in the Yakima Valley, or where you grow it in Vermont, it's kind of like, uh, grapes for winemaking, right? Like you can grow Chardonnay in Chablis in France, where it's very cool, uh, or you can grow Chardonnay in California, but those, those Chardonnays are going to come out very differently, even though they're the same genetics. So that's where, you know, our climate is, they're trying to find hop varieties that are better suited um, for Vermont's climate. 
Yeah, Cicero. Cicero? Is that what you said? Yeah, Cicero. Yeah. Uh, you get to drink a lot of beer. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm a, I'm a certified Cicero, which is the equivalent, uh, the beer equivalent of a sommelier. So, sommelier is to, to wine and Cicero is to beer. Um, it's a pretty rigorous uh, um, uh, study here. I studied for 10 months with a group of 10 people. We met twice a month. And then the exam is a seated exam for five hours. Uh, including three rounds of wine tasting, um, so it's a pretty it's a pretty rigorous um, <coughs> program. In Vermont, there are, uh, it's, it's 14 now, um, so it's pretty low. There's a step below that that's called certified beer server, and there's a few hundred of those. Um, but it's a uh, it's a program that's out of Chicago, and this uh, Ray Daniels founded it to to um, kind of uh, bring the beer world into and, and hold people accountable for saying that they actually know what they're talking about so to kind of get that certification so it's a lot of people in the industry i know uh, some brewers have it um, generally speaking it's it's, it's a it's like a, getting a degree credential okay. thank you thank you so much thank you.